I am having so much fun with this book. <laughs> So I have not only been meeting my Camp Nano goal of working on this book for one hour every day, I've been kind of demolishing it. <laughs> a lot of that is because I just, the way my work schedule kind of shook out, um, I was able to do all of my contracted work in the mornings and I've just been spending like three to four hours a day on this book. On Friday, I got a lot more character development work done. I did some work on the antagonist of the book and his profile and a couple of the most important side characters. And then today, which is Sunday and also yesterday, I went to Starbucks to work because I can now. It's funny how you come to appreciate these things, isn't it? <laughs> and um, it was great. I It feels like I'm really taking my time with the very beginning of this story and playing around with what I want to say. I am a big advocate of not starting your novel with a theme in mind because it often comes out kind of, you end up with a story that sounds kind of preachy because you're thinking too hard about getting that theme across. That's not always the case for every author, of course, but that's the case for me. Um, I like to figure out what the theme is as I'm writing it. But it is something I, I do keep in mind, especially when I'm developing the character, be, the main character, because, you know, when you're talking about how is a person going to change from the beginning of a story to the end, what is it that they need that they don't know that they need, what do they need to fix, what do they need to address about themselves, how are they going to grow, I mean, your theme is all going to be, that. that is your theme, right? So I've been thinking about the themes of it a lot, and really not, to be totally honest, I feel like I rushed this stage of Dragon Balloon and that led to the problems I had when I started feeling really stuck about halfway through that draft. There are other other things I've had little epiphanies about Dragon Balloon that I'll talk about later, but that, that was a big one. I think I rushed the development stage a little too much and I'm really enjoying taking my time with this one. So where I am right now is I used the beat sheet in the Save the Cat software to put the beats that I know I want in the story in place where I think they're going to go for now. Even if they're super vague, I put them there. And, and then I started at the beginning and for the first, let's see, I think three, three scenes, the opening image and the first two setup scenes, including the one with the theme stated, um, I just kind of like free wrote no, I wouldn't say free wrote the scene, but I've, I guess I have a, a rather untidy synopsis of what I want to happen in that scene. And I really like it. I really like every scene. I have the opening in image is kind of like, uh, it is a prologue. I would call it a prologue, even though there is no time difference between the prologue and the first chapter. What makes it a prologue, I think, is that it is not from the main character's point of view. She is in it on the outskirts, but it's from another character's main point of view and they are discussing her. So it, it's kind of like serves to fill the reader in on what's going on with this strange character before you get to hop into her head for most of the rest of the story. And there's, I mean, all of the scenes have conflict. There's an emotional change. There's a lot of fun setup. I know I keep talking about the world, the world building, but I'm just, so excited to be writing this world again. I can't, I can't. <sighs> so excited. Um, so I just, yeah, I'm taking my time and going really slowly. Something else that I figured out is, okay, first I want to show you something really cool about the Save the Cat software. You can change the dimensions of the board to make it look the way you want. I personally, I like to, once I I'm kind of, I don't need to look at the character and setting stuff anymore and I just want to see my beat sheet. I like going into full screen beat sheet mode and setting up dimensions so that I can see more or less all of the cards on the screen. That makes me feel like I'm standing in front of the giant cork board and I can see the full story or what the story is going to be. The other cool thing is this. 
So over here in the corner under the beats section, you can set up how many pages you want your story to be. You can change this at any time. And it does automatically generate a board and put all of the beats for everything in place. Like I scroll down here to the fourth act and you can see the finale, gathering the team, executing the plan, etc. Everything's all laid out for you. And if you notice the numbers, so if we have a 300 page book, the gathering the team part of the finale would come on page 250. But all you have to do is slide the card and you can see the page number changes. So you can slide them all around to represent which page you think you should be on. Now I do th think there is like a danger here. And it's the same danger that comes along with using any kind of method, structure method to find the plot or outline of your book. And I think this is why pantsers find plotting so off-putting. Um, it, it makes you feel restricted. When I first open up this big blank beat sheet and everything is where it's supposed to be, down to the page number, it makes, even though I know logically this is not the case, it makes me feel like I need to fill everything in and it needs to be exactly there or I'm doing it wrong. That is obviously not true. If you read Save the Cat Writes a Novel or any method book, if you read Superstructure or if you read, you know, The Snowflake Method, any, any book about structure, it will tell you that while all great stories follow, like they have structure, it's not an exact science every time. For example, lots of movies and lots of great books in the first act, the catalyst might happen way earlier than where it's supposed to go. And there might not even be a debate or the setup and the debate might be like kind of smashed together it's all fine. The beats are all there. It doesn't have to like perfectly, precisely, mathematically work out. The way a beat sheet board like this kind of makes us think it needs to work out. So, and I fall into that trap. It's so tempting to me to want to paint by numbers and just like fill these in and leave them where they are. And that is how you end up with a formulaic book in a bad way. Like, it's too, it's forced. And that is what I think is off-putting to so many writers. It of course does not have to be this way. That is why you can slide your note cards around to go wherever you want them to go. If you need your inciting incident to happen a little later, then you just slide that note card later. It's fine. It's fine. If you think you need only two setup scenes instead of four or however many, that's fine too, right? So I have to keep reminding myself of this. Like I don't have to stick to this template they gave me. This is just a starting point and now I get to play with it. I don't know why that gets in my head so much. Let me know if it works that way for you too. It's very weird. Anyway, so I'm at the point now where I'm just, I want to, I have my, like I said, act one is kind of coming along. I have that little prologue, the opening image really thought out. I have the first scene where you really meet Nil, really thought out. The second one is a little bit more vague, but it, it's coming along. I think I do need some more setup and I need to figure out what characters are in her life at this point because she is very much alone, but she can't be completely alone because of where she lives, if that makes sense. That said, I definitely have what I'm pretty positive is going to be the catalyst and she actually does have a debate. Part of her debate is going to be whether or not to accept this kind of offer that's been given to her and then once she knows she's going to accept it the second part of the debate is going to be preparing for what she's going to do next and figuring out a way to twist it to meet her needs if that makes sense i don't know if it does and um and yeah and then i definitely know the break into two and the whole act two is the inverse of act one thing is definitely very crystal clear to me like the first scene of act two i mean it's the pocket universe like it's probably pretty obvious from the title that's where she finds it and literally enters a new world so i've got that down and then the midpoint i'm still really set on i said early on that like i love midpoints i don't know why i love them even more than like the final twist i just love a good midpoint twist that turns everything sideways and I also really love, I mentioned superstructure earlier, I love James Scott Campbell's mirror image idea where the midpoint is a moment where the main character metaphorically looks at himself in the mirror 
and realizes he has to make a change or die. Not necessarily literally die, but die in some metaphorical sense. Or maybe really die. Um, and I really love that and cause, because once you read that book and you, you read his breakdown of it and understand what he's trying to say, you start to realize it truly is present in every story. It, it's, it's a little bit, it's almost creepy <laughs> how consistent this one beat is. And I have a mirror moment for this book that I'm super excited about. So I know what that's going to be. I also have, I'm looking at the beat sheet right now, I have at the beginning of the plat, bad guys close in section, I have a few ideas for a ticking clock to introduce to kind of like ramp up the tension and ramp up the stakes. And then I've got, what is this beat right here? Oh, the all is lost section. We're getting, my scene ideas are getting more and more vague as I go on. It's becoming more and more about the internal stuff that she's going to be going through, but that's a good thing. I, I, I need to focus on her emotional arc and I'm just going to trust that the external plot stuff is going to fall into place as I around it, if that makes sense, if I, as I continue to work on this. So I know the all is lost and I know the dark night of the soul, more or less. Um, honestly, finale, I got, I got nothing. I can see big exciting things happening, but she's going to be in so much trouble that I really don't know how I'm gonna get her out of it, but I think that's also a good thing at this point. And the final image is something I really like thinking about. I love the idea that the last scene of a story kind of is like the inverse or the opposite of the first scene. And that might be, I mean, definitely in terms of like who the protagonist is, who they've become, they're a very different person. They've changed in a fundamental way, but also a, l a lot of times it's, you know, where, where they are, like the actual setting. And I have, I definitely have some ideas there, but I'm nothing's set in stone yet because I genuinely don't know how this book is going to end as far as like external plot goes. The last thing that I have figured out in all my work this week is, um, or the last few days is the, uh, I really tried not to have a MacGuffin, but I just don't know. Can you write, can you write any kind of fantasy adventure novel without a MacGuffin? I don't think you can. And honestly, I like them. And I think the only way that they can get you into trouble is if, this object, whatever this thing is that the characters are all searching for, if it doesn't really have a point or tie in to the main character's emotional arc and their transformation. And this, this one does, this MacGuffin definitely does. This is an object that I had back in the original version of Warps and I really like it. It fits the world, it fits the story. It makes sense why people would be searching for it and would be desperate to find it and it what it can do will allow me to build to a really big dramatic climax and it definitely ties into Nil and her emotional issues and just who she is. So that's the work I've done in the last couple of days and it is, it's only Sunday, this vlog is going up Tuesday so I'm going to vlog a little bit more about my progress tomorrow. I would really like to have my scenes for act one kind of thought out by Friday. I think that would be really good progress to have made, but we'll see how it goes. I'm not going to rush it this time. Learned my lesson and yeah, I'm going to get back to work and I will check in with you guys tomorrow. Good morning. Okay, happy day five of NaNoWriMo. Uh, Lisa's live stream just started. I haven't mentioned this, I don't think, because I kept forgetting, but that live stream used to be Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. CST, 11 a.m. I don't, time zones, what are they? Anyway, check her channel. It's now on Mondays, every Monday, so if you can join us, that would be great. Um, we just started with a five minute warm up sprint. Clearly I am going to not be getting a lot of writing done during this sprint because I'm vlogging. But um, my goal for today, I've got my beat sheet. I'll open up on my second screen. And I think what I'm, I wanna do is I wanna read through 
the fleshed out scenes that I wrote, those first three that I think I talked about yesterday, and see if I can get a couple more thought out up until the catalyst. I think I have a good grasp, I know I have a good grasp on generally what the catalyst scene is. A particular character comes to Nil with an offer, but the problem is I'm still playing around with how much Nil knows about this guy and his real motives and how much he knows about Nil and her real motives. There is a whole backstory thing here and the backstory, some parts of it I have down and some parts of it I'm still kind of leaving loose and up in the air. I haven't locked in on anything yet and I'm okay with that for now but I think Today I kind of want to work through and settle on exactly what the backstory is so I know exactly what these two characters' dynamics are going to be in that catalyst scene. I hope all of that made sense. Um, I've talked about in the past I have a problem making books too complicated, plots, making plots too complicated, and that is like triply true when time travel is involved because I just get so caught up in the fun of paradoxes and you know loops and things like that I let myself run away with it and it ends up burying the character's emotional arc and I really don't want to do that this year this year in this book <laughs> so um, I'm trying to look at this backstory that Nil has and how this character is involved and remind myself to make it fun and give myself potential to set up a good twist and reveal later, but don't make it too complicated because ultimately that's not what readers or me, what I care about, what I care about is the characters. So anyway, that's my goal for today. I've got two minutes left and I need a refill before I actually start writing, so here we go. Okay, so I've got a couple minutes left in our second, third, uh, what's it called, sprint? But um, making really good progress. I think I've written about 650 words in this next scene and I started from literally, this is a setup scene and I had no idea what it was going to be about. Um, and then I thought of a, a setting, a little pawn shop that I had created in one of the previous versions and I was like, oh, that needs to be in this book and the owner of that pawn shop needs to be a side character. So I got that in there. I worked in, this is the, uh, what's it called, scene where the theme is stated in the Save the Cat, you know, beats. And I know what that's gonna be and I know who's gonna say it. And I am still working out, like I know what Nil is doing here and kind of what she wants um, and what's go the interaction between her and the pawn shop owner, but I don't have it all completely figured out yet, so I'm gonna keep working on that today, but I also have to get this vlog edited and uploaded for tomorrow, so that is gonna be it for this vlog. I will, of course, be checking in every day with my progress on this book. Um, I think probably Friday you're still gonna hear me talking about Act 1. I'm just spending a lot of time on this part, apparently. Um, but that's it. Please let me know how your first week of Camp Nano went if you're doing it, and if not, how everything else is going for you in the comments below and I will see you guys Friday with another vlog. <laughs> Bye.